And Eric, I'll turn it over to you and you can introduce our presenter today. Uh, yeah, so with that, we're ready to move on to the presentation. Uh, so I present to you, uh, Matt, if you go ahead and take it away, uh, we'll be happy to learn from you now. Okay, sorry about that. I had to figure out that Zoom won't let me share my audio in two places. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Bernhard. Um, as you've heard, uh, I work at Voting Works. Uh, so I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about that. Um, so who am I? I uh, have a PhD from the University of Michigan. I got my BS at Rice in computer science. Um, I, you know, that's kind of where I first fell in love with working on elections as a sort of uh, computer focused uh, uh, enterprise. Um, I've been working in elections for uh, over a decade now, um, basically trying to build solutions for improving um, elections, not just in the US, but, but uh, all over the world. Um, we can talk more about that later if you would like. Um, what's the point of this talk? Um, well, as you may have noticed, confidence in elections is at an all time low. Uh, and violent insurrection is no longer theoretical in the United States. Um, so my goal here is to motivate uh, y'all to um, contribute to election systems, whether that's you know becoming active in your local political system, whether that's uh, becoming a poll worker, um, whether that's submitting PRs to Voting Works code bases. Um, that's my goal of this talk. Um, but to get you started with that, I figured I would uh, just do a brief refresher on US elections and explain maybe why sometimes they suck. Um, U.S. elections are enormous. We have over 200 million registered voters in the country. Um, we are incredibly highly distributed. Um, elections are run at state, county, and local levels. So uh, in I know in Chicago and Illinois, you have, you have the city there, and you also, uh, in other parts, you have counties. Here in Michigan, we have, uh, not only do we have counties, we also have individual townships everywhere that are ultimately responsible for elections. So there, there's a lot of diversity in terms of who actually runs the election. Um, there's also a ton of complexity in elections, and I'll talk more a little bit about that in a minute here, but um, you know, we have to support over a dozen languages in some places, uh, like Chicago, I believe. Um, so you know, things can get pretty crazy. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there are uh, 13,000 voting jurisdictions and 187,000 more than that um, election precincts in the, in the United States. Um, and uh, we're also all sensitive to latency. Um, as those of you in Chicago are uh, this very night, as you are waiting anxiously to hear uh, the results of your mayoral primary. Um, so we want an election, we want a result on election night. And as we saw in 2020, um, that can have some uh, unpredictable effects. Uh, and I should also mention that in terms of voting technology, there are over 50 models of voting machines that have been used um, in the United States in about the past 10 years. Um, and just to hammer that point home, this is a really excellent map produced by Verified Voting that shows different kinds of voting technologies across the US. Uh, this is up to date uh, as of like a week ago when I pulled it. Um, and you can see that, you know, you don't really need to know exactly what the colors mean. But uh, the point is, there are lots of different kinds of voting machines everywhere. And there's lots of different kinds of voting machines, even within uh, states. You know, so this is uh, Texas, my home state, for example. Um, you can see that there are you know, just handmark paper in, in a lot of places. There's also no paper at all in some places. And then there's ballot marking devices in some places. Um, so it's, it's really just big and complicated. Um, and to, to get to the point about ballots, right, this is a ballot uh, from the, the 2016 uh, election in Dallas County, Texas. Um, and this is also that ballot. And these uh, six other pages are also that ballot. So it's not uncommon to have over 100 contests on a ballot in the United States. Um, and on top of that, now you have to translate into different languages and you have to somehow efficiently count and process them. So the way we do that usually is by using voting machines. Um, on the left here, you have one type of voting machine, an optical scanner. And on the right here, you have a ballot marking device. Um, the ballot marking device, a voter um, will uh, use a touch screen to produce a ballot. Um, a, a physical paper ballot, they'll take that paper ballot and put it in the optical scanner there on the left. And that is how the votes are tabulated. There are other kinds of technology like DREs, which I know are still used in one county in Illinois, um, that don't have any paper at all. The votes are cast and recorded on the exact same machine. 
Um, and then there's, you know, a uh, hundred variations of this across the United States, right? Um, but overwhelmingly, a handmarked paper with a BMD is probably the most common type of technology. So let's talk about hacking an election. Um, this is shy hack night after all. So, uh, you know, what, what are the goals of an attacker if they're trying to subvert an election? Well, one, one thing to do is, um, you know, try to, try to be visible. And this is sort of what Russia has done. Uh, certainly they did in 2016 um, and may try to do again. And they've also done it internationally. Um, so, so the ways that you can attack an election that are visible to other people, uh, you can alter election night results. Um, you know, you can take down, uh, there's a great story in Tennessee in, I think it was 2020, where WWE fans accidentally DDoSed uh, the local election night reporting server because one of the candidates was, I think, either a former wrestler or named after a wrestler. Um, and just, you know, by dint of that, and then rumors spread everywhere once the site went down that it was hacking. Um, so even, even uh, non-malicious things can be uh, very damaging to the election process and trust. Um, I mentioned denial of service there. And then there's also political in interference, as we saw in 2016, um, with, uh, you know, a foreign nation state actor uh, intervening on behalf of, uh, you know, attempting to discredit one of the uh, major candidates for president in the United States, for example, right? Um, and again, just to hit you with some more examples, uh, we know that these kinds of actors exist and we know that they attack elections not infrequently. Um, Ukraine has been a particular victim of this over, over the years. Um, Russia DDoSed their election night reporting system uh, in 2014. Uh, they also attacked their voter registration system, which caused really long lines uh, in, I think it was 2014. And then of course, as I mentioned, uh, political interference, um, you know, uh, Russia hacking John Podesta's email account, for example. Um, but that's not really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in invisible attacks, right? I want to know how could I change an election result with no one knowing, right? And it turns out that this is actually not straightforward. Um, you know, challenge number one to changing an election result is that, as I mentioned, we have very diverse and decentralized voting technology and administration. Uh, challenge number two is that by and large, voting machines are never connected to the internet. Um, this is more true now than it has been in the recent past, but it is generally true that um, you can't sit on your couch in Moscow and hack into a voting system, for example. Um, and challenge number three is that most votes, as I you know mentioned before, have a physical paper ballot that is tied to the uh, you know the votes that are tabulated. So if you know if the computers get hacked, you can always go back and look at the paper. Um, well, here's some reasons why those assumptions may not always hold up, right? Um, as many of you are probably familiar, we have this thing called the Electoral College, which means that a select few states typically wind up overturning or, or you know, determining the election result, right? Um, in 2016, I want to say something on the order of 80,000 votes could have flipped the election result uh, from Donald Trump winning to Hillary Clinton winning, right? In, in just three states. So, uh, you know, we're decentralized, yes, but we also have some other centralizing features that may mitigate that some. Uh, machines aren't connected to the internet. Um, many of you, I, I am sure, are familiar with like the Stuxnet attack, uh, where um, uh, the U.S. infected Iranian nuclear centrifuges, which are also not connected to the internet, by putting a virus on basically all USB devices in the world, uh, but that would only activate when it knew it was on the right device. Um, so it's you know possible that you could get malware on voting machines, right? Um, uh, you know, at, at every uh, during every election, you also have to program the voting systems, right? Even though they're not connected to the internet, you have to know who are the candidates, what are you voting for, and that's going to change every time you run an election, right? So there is, has to be some data input and output to the voting systems at some point. Um, and finally, uh, you know, yes, a lot of people use paper, but paper is sort of a complicated security mechanism. And I'm going to talk about this. Uh, this was part of a research study that I performed in 2019-2020, uh, um, uh, where we examined how useful paper can be to voters uh, for or to elections uh, for providing security. So, um, you know, one possible thing to attack, right? This is your general flow of an election, as I described before, where you have either a ballot marking device where a voter marks it and then prints their ballot, or they mark the ballot by hand. Hopefully the voter then reviews the ballot and then deposits it in the scanner. So one easy thing to do is to just hack the scanner. Um, if you hack the scanner, it doesn't matter what paper you feed into it. Um, it's going to give you whatever result you want. But as I mentioned, the problem with that is you still have the paper ballots, right? So if you perform an audit 
uh, on the back end, you can compare those results with the scanned, uh, you know, the, the reported results from the scanner. And usually you'll figure out whether or not, you know, something has gone awry. Um, there's actually a really cool statistical technique for this called a risk limiting audit. Um, we can chat about that more later if you're interested in it. Um, and it's been piloted in a lot of different states. Um, this is a slightly out of date map. More states are coming online with RLAs. I think Connecticut, North Carolina, um, Georgia is now doing them by law um, and a bunch of others. Um, so, so those kinds of audits are already happening. And in fact, VotingWorks actually works to help states run those audits uh, with some of our open source software that again, I'll, I'll mention at the end. Um, so, okay, cool. We're doing this audit thing. So we have a paper trail. We can confirm that the scanning results are correct. Well, what's another way we could fool the scanner, right? What's another way we could, we could produce an outcome that is incorrect? Well, you know, if you hack the ballot marking devices over here, um, the paper trail is going to be corrupted. And then even if you do an audit, you're going to get the wrong result. Uh, but hopefully voters would catch that, right? They had this review, uh, this review step. Uh, it turns out that that's not as straightforward as you might think. Um, people are not necessarily very good at reading hundreds of contests on a sheet of paper under time pressure of people waiting in line behind them. Um, and it turns out that uh, in a lot of jurisdictions, there isn't a, a heavy emphasis on encouraging voters to review their paper. So uh, you know, the rates of verification of paper is quite low. And, and this is actually what we found in our 2019 study, uh, 2020 study, excuse me, um, that has been, um, you know, the follow on work from other researchers has sort of confirmed our results, which is a little unfortunate. Um, so, uh, you know, all that said, you know, there are techniques that we do know work to improve people's uh, abilities to verify paper ballots. Um, I have some links here on the slide that you can uh, go read if you're super interested. Uh, but anyways, um, I've described to you sort of this really niche mechanism for attacking an audit or for attacking an election, excuse me, but, you know, does it really matter, right? Um, you know, are we actually that concerned about people uh, somehow writing us the next Stuxnet to infect all of our voting systems? Um, it turns out that maybe not, right? Um, the intelligence community doesn't seem to be particularly concerned about this. Um, I, you know, in reality, elections are a very large, uh, complex threat surface that have lots of different ways that they can be affected. Um, you know, as we saw in 2016, voter registration systems were, were scanned. And as we've seen in other countries, there are lots of other pieces beyond just voting machines that can be probed and, and hacked by, by actors. Um, and as we saw in 2016 and, and 2020, misinformation is really cheap. So why would I spend millions of dollars developing this bespoke uh, virus to infect all these voting systems when I can spend like $1,000 hiring a bunch of bots on Twitter to say mean things about me, right? Um, you know, so so as I said, you know, after the uh, 2020 election, the IC community came out with this joint statement saying that basically the election was the most secure in American history. Um, you know, you can uh, we can talk more about whether or not that's true and, and how they're making that evaluation later. But um, however, you know, despite the intelligence community making such this this broad claim and, you know, they're largely being a peaceful transfer of power thereafter. There was still some bad things. So I'm gonna give you a content warning here if you don't like looking at images of violence or images of idiots. Um, as you may recall, about two years ago, um, there was an armed insurrection that stormed the US Capitol and actually successfully got in, right? Um, these were people who were trying to break in and stop the electoral process from proceeding as it has for literally the entire history of this country. Um, but you know we're talking thousands of people here what would make them feel so strongly that this outcome must be wrong right or that there must be some other uh there must be some other recourse for them to take beyond just democracy right um and I, so I, I don't think it's unfair to say that regardless of of how we feel about our voting system it's not doing enough to give you know proper confidence to people and you're never going to convince everybody but having even more firm ground to stand on moving forward is probably where we want to go, right? So how can we do that? Uh, this is largely what VotingWorks' mission is focused on. Um, we are trying to provide more evidence. Um, as I mentioned before, we need more post-election audits. Um, we, you know, the state of Georgia started doing post-election audits in 2020. Um, there, uh, that year, confidence in the election outcome was about 57%. Uh, they continued doing them all the way through this most recent election, and uh, confidence seemed to rebound in Georgia 
Um, and, you know, we can quibble a little bit about whether that's attributable to the audit or not, but I think it's, you know, not unreasonable to say that election officials taking strong actions to provide, you know, transparent processes and, and show that there are no tricks up their sleeves uh, goes a long way to building confidence. Um, but we need to provide maybe a little bit more confidence than just audits, right? Audits are sort of a arcane process that most people don't care about or know about. Um, so what else can we do? And this is really what my work has focused on over the last couple of years. Um, and you know, to get there, we have to start thinking about why voting machines are bad in the first place. Um, it, you know, in general, there are pretty perverse market incentives. Um, you're not going to make an investor rich by selling voting machines to Cook County, right? That's just not how it works. Um, you're working with local governments who have budgets on the order of millions of dollars, not you know anything more than that. And that's if you're in a wealthy area. Um, there's has been this really cumbersome regulatory regime over voting systems. Uh, there's this thing called the Voluntary Voting Systems Guideline um, that was put in place in 20, uh, 2002 after the Bush v. Gore fiasco um, that was meant to sort of help provide more assurance that voting systems are you know, actually uh, doing what they say they're doing. Uh, and it turns out that the, the first uh, crack that we had at that, we didn't really get right. Um, there's actually been a new standard passed uh, last two years ago, I think, um, that actually fixes a lot of the problems with the old standard, but you know, you're steering a battleship, so it's going to take us a while to actually get um, to where that new standard is, is having a significant impact on the market. Um, and also there's willful security practice, in part due to the regulatory regime and the market incentives, and also just in part to like most people are trusting when they think about, excuse me, most people were trusting when they think about elections, you know, prior to 2016, no, most people didn't give it a second thought. So vendors could get away with an awful lot. Um, so how, how can we address some of these concerns? Um, as I mentioned, we're an open source outfit. We're, we're also off the shelf hardware. So you can go to Best Buy and buy our voting system and download our code and run our voting system if you want. Um, as I mentioned, there's new regulation that makes some of the old stuff uh, a little bit less of a problem. Um, and also working uh, hand in hand with, with uh, experts in usability and security in, in other areas um, to provide sort of uh, a good platform from the ground up uh, is sort of our approach. Uh, as I just said. Um, so let's talk about security because that's what I'm here to talk about. That's what, I, what gets me out of bed. Um, in the voting works system, all votes are, get printed on a paper ballot. We don't have any uh, direct record uh, stuff like that. Uh, so you always have a paper record to go back to if you have to. Um, as I mentioned, we're open source and we have off the shelf components. Um, and we're utilizing security, modern security features like uh, secure and trusted boot, um, which is really what I want to talk about. Um, so we have this open source system, we have this off the shelf hardware, you know, what's to stop someone from going to Best Buy and impersonating our voting system in the, in the polling location, right? Um, and this is actually a, a pretty serious and pernicious problem across the United States where voting systems uh, prior to election day have to get to the church down the street or the school gymnasium before election day, right? And so oftentimes they're just left you know, in public spaces, more or less. So on the left here is Ed Felton, a professor at Princeton, um, standing next to a voting system, I think, in a community center. Um, on the right here is a picture I took on election night in Atlanta um, in a high school gymnasium uh, where it was just me and the voting systems, right? Uh, so that's not great, right? You don't want to give your attacker unfettered access to your system unmonitored, right? Um, so how can we like deal with that, right? So the attacker in this scenario can like boot the machines, they can replace components, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and physical security we know is not enough, right? Um, DEF CON does a, a voting village every year and uh, a tamper evident village every year and you can go and you can learn how to break these seals. It's actually really easy. Um, as I mentioned, you can see this blue pull tie seal here on this machine that I, I stood next to in Georgia. Um, those you can break open with a soda can. Um, and I have a video I can show you all later if you want of how to do that. Um, and the problem here, right, is that then you can make the voting machine run Doom because it's just any, it's just a computer at that point. So how do we fix that? Um, <clears throat> we're using a, a custom signed firmware and a Linux kernel stack uh, using you know, trusted boot and secure boot um, to uh, prevent other binaries from being loaded by the system. Uh, we're also using measured boot 
back with the TPM. It's very similar to like Microsoft's uh, BitLocker process, if you're familiar with that, except it's all open source. Um, and if you've ever seen this screen, then you've dealt with secure boot and trying to boot something your computer was trying not to let you boot. Um, we are uh, also deploying on a cryptographically immutable root partition. We're using the Linux kernel's DM Verity um, uh, capability to do that. Uh, so basically any executable on the system is, is read only, you can't change it, um, as well as uh, other data on the system. And it, it all gets cryptographically verified at boot time as well as uh, live when the system is running. Um, and we've also implemented application layer integration for attestation. Uh, so you can go up to one of our machines, and this is an example from the heads wiki, but it's a very similar concept. You can go up to one of our machines and push a button and it'll show you a code, right? And it's just a regular TOTP style code. Uh, so beforehand, you can scan a QR code and enroll a key in your phone, and you can make sure that this key matches the key on your, uh, on your trusted device. Uh, and by doing that, uh, this leverages some TPM functionalities that, that are um, pretty you know, tamper proof, uh, tamper evident at least. Tamper resistant is the word I'm looking for. Um, and uh, by doing that, you can verify basically at any time that the machine is running the, the correct software, right? So what we're building next, uh, we're working on reproducible builds of our system images. You know, we're trying to bring transparency to this election tech process. Uh, and so I think a big part of that is being able to reproduce the same image, system image time after time. Uh, because if we do that, we can then just put our whole build pipeline in the cloud um, and anyone can run it and verify that the binaries we have on our machine is the one that you know corresponds with our open source code and, in, on GitHub. Um, we're also, I think, almost completely done with smart card attestation and authentication. Um, you know, we can leverage some really cool features of TPMs and, and like regular Java cards to uh, you know do some really neat uh, authentication mechanisms. Um, and we're also working on more robust chain of custody stuff. Um, that's very much a blue sky idea right now, but uh, we're building it out. So um, that's basically the end of my talk. Uh, I just want to close by saying, you know, here are some ways that you can help. Uh, you can become a poll worker in your ele local elections. Um, the average age of a poll worker is 75 in the United States. The average age of a poll worker is 75. Uh, so certainly getting, getting more eyes and especially people with more technical backgrounds uh, in that uh, area is is welcome and will help. Um, you can also talk to your politicians, local, state, and federal about uh, ways to reform elections, ways to improve trust. Um, and as I mentioned, you can also submit PRs to our repository. So on the left, I have a QR code that points to the link that's there on the slide um, that goes to our risk limiting audit software. And on the right, I have a, a link to our voting system software repository. So with that, uh, I will close and thank you all so much for, for listening to me and Moran here for 25 minutes. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, we'll be on the lookout now for questions from our audience. Um, a reminder to our audience, um, please share your questions through the YouTube chat. We'll be looking. Um, and um, while we're waiting, uh, Matt, I'll ask the first question. Um, which is, so you've, you've, you've spoken to a number of uh, election security related issues. I'm wondering, um, you know, other outside of Shy Hack Night, who is the key audience when making a case for updating some of our election security practices? Um, it's, it's very broad. It's surprisingly broad. Um, it's, you know, uh, to some degree, it's policymakers, um, you know, if they make make people do a thing, then they do the thing often, um, you know, but but really it's election officials, um, getting election officials on board with some of these changes, especially ones that aren't any more work for them, um, has been, you know, far and away the most effective solution that we found to actually getting getting change done. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned policymakers, the biggest, the biggest uh, challenge for election officials is unfunded mandates. And so it's, it's all well and good if you can pass a law that says your election official has to do X, Y, and Z. But if they don't have the budget to hire the people or buy the things they need to do that, um, that's a major problem. Um, and one, you know, to that end, um, uh, the uh, I want to say it's the Help America Vote Act, HAVA, uh, that was passed in 2002 after Bush v. Gore, um, is still on the books and is still used occasionally to disperse federal, federal funding. Um, so during COVID, it was used 
um, to disperse funding to a jurisdiction so they could like actually pay for you know masks and hand sanitizer and or switch to mail-in voting if they needed to. Um, so that kind of thing is also very effective. So uh, if you're talking to a policymaker, ask them for money. And if you're talking to an election official, ask them how you can help them. Uh, we have a question from the audience uh, from Michael wondering if there's anything other countries are doing with voter machine security that's really cool that we should be doing here that you could share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this is one of the major challenges that we have in the U.S. is that we are a federal system, or we are not, we're a federal system, so we're primarily, you know, the power resides with the states. Um, but countries like Estonia, uh, Switzerland, um, Australia um, are all pushing boundaries for, for various election technologies. You know, internet voting is very common in those places. Um, Switzerland in particular, um, their postal service is in charge of developing a um, online voting application basically called it's the Swiss post voting system. Um, and they're, so they're leveraging, um, like cryptography, like end to end cryptography, uh, with some really cool, like, um, you can do Elgamal, uh, uh, encryption to like homomorphically tally, um, encrypted ballots so that you can count all the ballots and the voters can like check that their ballot was counted, but they don't have to reveal how they voted. Um, so S Switzerland has been trying to implement a system like that for a while, um, and they've been putting it up for public testing, which is really, really great. Um, Estonia, one of the earlier test cases for this kind of thing, didn't do that as much. Um, and I think it did hurt the public confidence in that portion of their election system. Um, and so Swiss Post has been working with, um, you know, people like uh, Matt Blaze and Sarah Jamie Lewis to like actually uh, vet their crypto. And they've found problems and they've responded to them, which is really cool. Um, I'll ask another question too, which is uh, at Shy Hack Night, we usually try to break down whatever jargon where we can. So I was wondering, uh, there's some terms you use that might benefit the audience to explain in particular stuck out to me. It's like what you mean by TPM and what secure boot sure. is mm -hmm. and how that might uh, relate to the different sort of Linux kernels that you mentioned using. Yeah, yeah. So um uh, let's see, I'll start with TPM. TPM is a trusted platform module. Um, it's a little cryptographic coprocessor that sits um, on your you know, computer's motherboard next to your CPU. And if your CPU needs to perform some particularly sensitive operation, you know, it needs to store a, a, a cryptographic key for something, um, it can talk to the TPM and do it that way. Um, TPMs are also tamper resistant. They have some really cool features um, they're they're totally unique. So they have fuses in the like <clears throat> in the silicone in them uh, that um, basically allows each TPM to be completely uniquely identifiable. So you can't just rip one out of one machine and put it in another. Um, and using TPMs, Microsoft and this is really like a Microsoft uh, push um, started requiring that um, all commodity, you know, consumer electronics that boot Windows have TPM chips and support UEFI secure boot. So that's like uh, uni the unified extensible firmware interface uh, secure boot, um, which basically as the system is booting itself up and it's loading different pieces of the system into memory or, or it's, you know, powering on the processor, um, it can use the TPM to do cryptographic hashing of all those things. And then when it's done, the operating system can look at that hash and make sure that it's correct. So if someone were to um, hack the firmware on your motherboard, for example, um, your operating system could potentially detect that and alert you of it, if nothing else. If you've ever seen the scary BitLocker recovery screen, um, that that may be uh, what, you know, it may be that somehow you flashed a different operating system on or your hard drive changed in a way that the OS wasn't expecting. Um, so that's what Secure Boot does. Yeah, and could you maybe also explain how the cryptographic cryptographic signing like plays into that? Like how how it's able to tell? Uh, yeah, or not yeah, yeah. So so all machines come with uh, from the um, uh, you know from Asus or Dell or whoever. Um, Microsoft uh, distributes um, public signing public keys to them that live in the firmware on the machine. And so uh, if you have Secure Boot turned on from the factory, it will only allow you to boot Windows and then a couple of Linux distributions that have worked with Microsoft to get their software signed. 
Um, and it may actually be broader than that now because they finally made that public that process public. Um, so basically, um, your you know your kernel, you know your whole operating system, um, your firmware, uh, all of those things are signed by either the vendor or Microsoft or you, right? You can also put your device into user mode where you get to put the keys in the system. And then as long as, you know, whatever um, EFI executable you're loading was signed with your key that the firmware recognizes, then it will boot that. And then anything else it won't boot. So that's a, a very high level uh, version of that. Sure, thanks. Thank you for the explanation. Um, the next question um, is, uh, what is VotingWorks current scope slash business and funding model? Yeah, so we are a nonprofit. Um, so we are, you know, entirely, well, not entirely, we are primarily funded through donations. Um, if you'd like to make a donation, I dropped our, um, uh, our website in the chat. Um, we, uh, so we have some, some donors. We also uh, are slowly becoming self-sustaining on at least one of our products. Um, our post-election auditing product is, you know, has, as it's been adopted in over a dozen states by now, um, we are um, able to take some, some revenue from that and turn it back into improving that product and also building better voting machines. Um, the voting machine side of thing, uh, side of things is a little more complex because you, you know, there's the, the certification regime that I mentioned, um, getting through the, a certification campaign with the uh, Election Assistance Commission, the federal body that oversees um, basically voting machines, um, is very expensive and time consuming. And we've only existed for four years. And oh, by the way, they changed the standard halfway through. So um, so our, our current, you know, we're, we're currently undergoing the process of getting certified to the new standard. And that will open up a lot more markets for us where hopefully we can be a little bit more self-sustaining, but uh, primarily we're a nonprofit funded by donors. Cool. Um, we also had another audience question wondering, uh, do you think it would be best if all play, polling places use the same technology like a voting work system, or is there some added security in having different technology used in different places? I, I go back and forth on this one. Um, it depends on the kind of adversary you're considering. So like maybe like a nation state, it wouldn't really make a difference to them. So like, why bother? Um, I don't know that you are, um, I don't know that you are, you know, if you're all in one system, if you're like necessarily lowering the bar to hacking your system per se. Um, so, you know, I think personally, I would like to see a publicly owned, you know, federal voting system if possible, but you know that has lots of thorns in it. And and the other thing to to realize is that not everywhere votes the same way. Um, so Colorado is an all vote by mail state. You know, most most places aren't like that. So you you can't even have the same system everywhere if you wanted to. It has to be you know different in some level. So you know, uh, it, it's not a question I, I spend too much time worrying about because I know it will never happen. Uh, <laughs> I guess is the short answer. The diversity of this country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, along, I think that kind of leads into another question that I was uh, wondering, which was um, like you talked a little bit about this sort of uh, risk based approach to like measuring threats. And so I wonder, like, if you could talk a little bit more about how you would do risk assessment, like how would you measure the risk of voting being compromised and how that might like vary depending on I mean, I don't know. Does it vary depending on municipality or state mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. voting system, uh, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think primarily it varies by contest. Um, so, you know, for example, the mayoral race in Chicago is very important to the city of Chicago, but is not that important to me here in Michigan, right? Um, and certainly is probably not that important to Vladimir Putin or whoever, what up, enter other, you know, global scary bad guy. Um, but, you know, president certainly is. Uh, and, you know, with the, the way the electoral college is structured and stuff like that, I think it makes it more of an attractive target. Um, the flip side of that is your, your small local races don't have a lot of eyes on them usually. Um, and it's actually, uh, it turns out with, with like, uh, performing statistical audits, it's actually really hard to do on small local races, um, because to get a big enough sample to confirm an outcome, you need to count basically all the ballots all the time, uh, which is a huge pain. And so no one does it. Um, 
they, there are usually like uh, fixed audits that are done instead. They'll count 2% of the ballots or whatever in every contest. And, and you know, that usually is good enough. Um, but, you know, so on the one hand, like it, it's easy to, ha to hack the dog catcher race, but on the other hand, the resource attackers probably don't care about it. So, you know, that's generally the way that I, I think about it. Um, and, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm less worried about actual voting systems being hacked these days than I am about someone claiming they've been hacked because that seems to have been a much more successful campaign. So. Um, I'll actually ask about that side of uh, things, which is um, who are the responsible parties for dealing with that concern? Because it is a part of election security. We've seen um, CISA play a role in informing the public or policymakers. Mm -hmm. We've seen uh, American media uh, trying to get the word out. I'm wondering from your perspective, is there a broader role? Is there someone who should be responsible for this? And what are the types of things that we can do to consider this as part of our election security strategy? Yeah, I don't, I don't really know, honestly. I, I don't have a good answer. I think to some degree it has to be, and this is, pardon the cheesiness here, it has to be democratized. Like it has to be, you know, all stakeholders all the time have to be doing, you know, fighting misinformation basically, because, you know, sure, uh, you know, Anderson Cooper or Sean Hannity can come out tomorrow and say the elections are fine or they're not, but like, you know, only how much, what fraction of people actually watch cable news, you know? Um, sure, CISA can release a statement, but how many Americans know what the hell CISA is? Um, so I, I really do think it's like almost down to an individual level of like, you know, I've heard this really specious claim about the election or my friend just told me that they thought this thing had happened. Like, I'm gonna research it and then push back a little bit if I find that they're wrong or, you know, uh, whatever, right? I think, you know, and, and that's, that's sort of what we're trying to do, right? Is build a external community of experts who, you know, we don't have to take our word as a voting system vendor for what we're doing, right? You don't, you, you don't have to listen to us if you don't want to. You can, you can go to the guy down the street or the, you know, the, the expert in your city hall or whatever, um, and they can independently verify stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's a really thorny problem. I'm curious uh, a little bit maybe of around, this might relate to like the sort of historical origins of your organization, but, uh, like in your talk, you mentioned, uh, and just now you mentioned too, um, well, one question ago, you mentioned that you weren't uh, concerned with, uh, weren't as concerned with hacking and security so much as the perception of that. And so I'm kind of curious, like, was that a journey that you went on or the organization went on? Was the initial concern around hacking? And then, you know, you were through research able to verify the risks or if you could share a little bit more of that like kind of story, I think that'd be interesting. Yeah, so that's more, much more a personal journey kind of thing. I think um, I came into this space, um, you know, in the early 2010s and uh, I started grad school in 2015 and my, my PhD advisor was like, you gotta find something else to work on because no one cares about elections, um, which is very funny in retrospect. Um, but I started out in this academic, you know, very ivory tower like, everything has to be perfect. You know, everything has to be the platonic ideal. Otherwise it's not good enough. Um, and it turns out that that is like a pretty bad mentality for dealing with most things in the real world. Um, so, you know, starting out thinking, oh, you know, we have to worry about Russia hacking into our voting systems. Um, this is a really big problem. Like we need to shout it from the rooftops. Um, you know, there's a CCC talk I gave in 2016 that you can go watch if you want, um, where that's kind of what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I got some, I don't know, mixed feedback about that. You know, as I started working more and more with election officials, I started to realize that like, maybe I'm the crazy guy in the room, you know? Um, and as I started to really understand how robust and like, um, yeah, just how robust the election system is in most places, like how many checks and balances there are, how many different components of the system there are. You know, it started to make me feel like, you know, maybe, maybe it's all right. You know, it's, it's sort of, you know, Dr. Strangelove, but uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, there, there, yes, there are lots of problems. We should still work on them. Yes, I am still concerned about voting system hacking, but like, it is probably not my top concern about elections these days. So, um, yeah, 
it's been a journey. It, it's a really good point though that you make, which is that like sometimes the domain experts or the technologists, like that might mean that we know more, but it doesn't always mean that we know better than yeah. the people who are actually like facing those issues. So I think that's really interesting and I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, might have to go dig up that talk just to yeah just to yeah you can see where you're uh, coming from I, we got death threats after it so you know just to tell you like what level we were on this was like this was like late december 2016 so like everyone was still very you know ah about the election and yeah mm -hmm. yeah uh well we still have a few more questions on the camera and if you wanted to ask some of them well matt i think you said that you're from uh where, where are you from originally texas yeah Okay, so I am as well, and I saw the map that you put up. Um, I'm wondering, can, can you give us a sense of some of the factors that determine whether a single state has many different um, uh, voting uh, recording methods? Can you, can you give us mm -hmm. like what determines that, the coloration that was on that map? For different yeah, states? I think it, you know, so most states, it is a county level decision. Um, so even in Michigan, like our elections are administered at the township level, but the counties make the purchasing decisions. Um, and I think some of that, I, I don't understand how it works here in Michigan exactly. I think, I, I don't understand the reasoning behind it, I mean. Um, but, you know, so states like Texas, where they're all about, you know, small government, individual responsibility, et cetera, right? I think that's where you tend to see that kind of thing more. Um, you know, really the answer is like, the legislature passed a bill in 1895 that said elections shall be administered either at the state or the county level, and it's been that way ever since. And no one wants to mess with it. Um, you know, one of the one of the hardest problems with getting election policy change through is that elected officials assume that the elections couldn't have been that bad because that it elected them, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think it's mostly that. So there are a couple of states that do it all centrally: Georgia, Maryland, Hawaii. Um, maybe a few others that I'm not thinking of. Um, but, uh, you know, the vast majority of states is at the county level. And then, you know, in terms of what equipment they use, um, a lot of it has to do with how many languages they have to support. So like Texas, California, Florida, um, you know, uh, Michigan, less so, but, you know, Illinois, for sure. Um, when DREs came out, the the direct recording electronic voting systems, the ones that don't have any paper, when those came out, a lot of those states jumped on those because it was easier for them to administer um, and to program the ballots and to you know have it be uniform and consistent across the United States or across the state. Um, uh, whereas you know states like Texas, like Harris County, did because it has you know two point now it has two point two million voters and they have to support like five different languages on their ballots. But like you know Webster County or you know insert other small Texas county here didn't, right? There are some counties that never switched from hand mark, hand count paper, I think, you know, like Loving County that has like 700 people that live there, um, you know, don't really. And that's that's been a common theme too, like New England is also really big on the hand counting. Um, so, so tradition is probably the biggest factor if I had to guess. I just tried to, the idea of counting ballots by hand is I feel like my brain would melt but I assume that some people are suited to it <laughs> I well no actually that this is actually a huge um uh misconception I guess like my, my challenge to people is to go buy a ream of paper at Staples and take it home and open it and count every piece of paper in the in the ream and then see if you get the same number that was on the outside of the package and then when you don't do it again and see if you get it then because you won't and now imagine doing that, but for a hundred different contests, right? On a hundred different pieces, you know, on millions of pieces of paper. Um, you know, if you have if you have no voters, basically, you can do it. But beyond that, it's it's really really hard. Mm. Okay. Well, we have just a little bit more time, and I think just a couple more questions. Um, So uh, one question we had too is like, uh, who who does your organization end up partnering with? Like, who are your stakeholders? And uh, assuming, like, how do you explain the security measures you're taking and sort of like pitch <laughs> that to the folks that may be more policy oriented and less like technically inclined? Yeah. Um, 
trying to think of a diplomatic way to say this. In general, we don't, um, you know, like uh, we know our system is secure. We know that we can get certifications that say it's secure. Um, we know that we have good practices. We do regular pen testing. We, you know, our code is open source. Like anyone can poke at it if they want. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting because election officials have recently become IT professionals in addition to all the other things they do. Um, and so, it, you know, there's also been massive turnover in most elections offices in the last like five years. Um, so there's actually a lot of new blood that has a ton of technical depth. Um, so it's actually not as hard there. Um, I gave I gave a sort of different version of this talk at a um, meeting of basically state CIOs and CISOs, and they all already knew what Secure Boot was and what TPMs were and stuff. So, you know, that was cool. Um, but you know, definitely your local election official, it can be a struggle at times, and that's where we just try to make it. You know, like our attestation process is. You know, look at this number, compare it to that number. Do they match? Okay, cool, you're good. Um, you know, trying to make it as usable and simple as possible is, you know, our primary goal. All right. I think, Eric, we can um, leave it there. Sure. Uh, Matt, thank you for an awesome presentation and for fielding these questions. Uh, learned a lot. Um, I think, Eric, you and I, do we have any outstanding announcements or now we just say um, folks who want to join the um, post presentation Zoom call? Uh, so shout out to Josh. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We will be going Zoom. And if Matt, if you're able to join, I'm sure uh, if you're, if there's people who have continuing questions or want to continue to talk about the issue afterwards, I'm sure you'd be welcome to once we break into breakout groups. Um, of course, we also want to be respectful of your time as well. So if you can't stick around, uh, that's that's fine too. But um, that's what we'll do next. I think the only thing left to do is for us to uh, say the magic words. All right. With that, we'll say bye and that folks can go. Forward. Go forth and hack.